Hi, good morning everybody, um, and thank you for coming, thank you for joining us, um, and thank you to the organisers of this conference for recognising the importance of this subject, uh, supporting at-risk land and environmental defenders. The subject of indigenous peoples and forest-dependent communities has come up quite a few times at this conference, but in the sessions I've attended, I haven't heard reference to the violence and the intimidation that these groups routinely face when a company wants to exploit their land. In 2017, a minimum of 207 land and environmental defenders were murdered for defending their land, their way of life, their culture and the environment that they and we all depend on from predatory and unwelcome business projects. That's a minimum of four people per week in what is a vastly underreported subject. This is, without exaggeration, one of the most critical issues of our time, the insatiable scramble for land and natural resources, which is resulting in the escalating and unequal struggle between indigenous peoples, communities, and the forces of predatory capitalism. And the killings are just the tip of the iceberg. Defenders and their communities are facing extreme violence, physical intimidation, and criminalization and women are particularly badly affected because of widespread sexual violence. Last year, according to our figures, agribusiness took over from oil and mining as the deadliest sector for defenders, with 46 people killed for protesting against palm oil, coffee, uh, tropical fruit and sugar plantations. In addition to mining and oil, the other deadliest sectors last year were wildlife poaching and logging. Corruption is a major factor as businesses and corrupt politicians often collude to award concessions and contracts. This corruption ensures that communities cannot hold their abusers to account, <coughs> nor can they access the legal and democratic channels that should be open to them. On the contrary, the perpetrators of the violence are very often the police and the military. Whilst this is a serious problem, it's one that can be addressed, not least by the many organizations, companies, and governments that are here in Oslo at this conference. And the purpose of this panel is to explore how we can prevent the scenarios that force ordinary communities into the position of having to be defenders, and how to support these defenders in a frontline struggle that ultimately affects us all. Um, just so you know how this is going to run, I'm going to ask a, a round of questions, and the panelists will have uh, five minutes each, uh, which I need to strictly uh, enforce, according to the organisers. Um, and then I'll ask them a follow-up round of uh, questions, and then I'll open, uh, open it up to the audience. If you want to use the app, the much-publicised app, feel free. Uh, we're also uh, very happy to use the microphone, if you would prefer to use that. Now, to our, our, our rather short panel, um, in that our business representative has, has gone AWOL, um, but hopefully he'll, he'll turn up. Um, it's hard to think of a, a group of people who are better qualified to explore the issue than, than, than the people we have here. An alternative view, according to some, is that this panel includes anti-development activists, troublemakers, criminals, and one terrorist, which illustrates the kind of problems we face here. <laughs> the majority of us sitting here have lost a colleague, a friend or family member in targeted assassination. So I'd like to introduce you uh, in the order in which they're going to speak, which is not necessarily the order in which they're sitting. First, Claudelisa Silva dos Santos. Uh, she's a land and environmental defender from the state of Pará, in Brazil, which is the most dangerous state in the most dangerous country in the world to be a land and environmental defender. Clara Lisa is studying law at the Federal University of South and Southeast Pará. She's a traditional Amazon extractivist, environmental activist, feminist, and member of JETI, the group of extractivist women workers. Next up will be Fran Lambrick of Not One More, an organization that she co-founded following the murder of her colleague and the subject of a documentary film she was making, Chutvuti, a Cambodian forest activist and community leader in Cambodia, 
who incidentally one time used to work for Global Witness as well. Not One More is an environmental uh, campaign group that supports environmental defenders uh, and investigates the root causes of environmental conflict. At the end, Felipe Milanez, a professor of decolonization of knowledge at the Federal University of Rocancabo of Bahia, Brazil. He's also a journalist and filmmaker uh, and a football fan, I gathered last night. Um, but I think that's everyone in Brazil. Uh, uh, he's uh, editor of National Geographic Brazil, and he's written over 100 articles about the violence against uh, indigenous peoples and environmentalists. Um, and a bit of a plug, uh, with Bernardo Loyola, he also co-directed the documentary, film documentary Toxic Amazon, which will be screened tonight as part of the forum at the Oslo House of Literature at 7.30. I'd encourage everyone to go to that. Um, I would introduce Christopher Stewart, if he was here, who heads um, Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability at OLAM, which is a global agribusiness company operating in 66 countries. And, and Christopher has first-hand experience of uh, working with local communities who are being affected by the company's projects. Um, I'd, I'd say that we actually had quite a job trying to get an, in, uh, an industry representative on the panel, um, and we thought we got over it. But anyway... Um, and last, but certainly not least, is Vicky Torley Corpus, the UN Special Rapporteur for the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, Vicky is a rock star to many of us working in this field um, <laughs> because of her courageous and her tireless work traveling the world, working with and defending the rights of Indigenous people. And as I mentioned earlier, she's the one who has the dubious honor of being branded a terrorist by the leader of her own country, President Duterte of the Philippines. She doesn't look like a terrorist, but anyway. Um, so, straight into the questions. Claudalisa, can you tell us your story? Why are you a defender? And what does it mean to you? Bom dia a todos. Um, eu me tornei... Na verdade, eu sempre fui, sempre morei na floresta, mas eu me tornei uma ativista, uma defensora mais forte ainda e mais veemente ainda há sete anos atrás, quando eu recebi uma notícia pela manhã, às oito horas da manhã, que o meu irmão havia sido assassinado juntamente com a sua companheira, sua companheira da vida, sua companheira de luta. E eles não só... Mataram o corpo como mutilar o corpo. Cortaram a orelha dele e levaram. Para provar e para mostrar que aquilo era um recado. Para quem continuasse aquelas lutas, para quem continuasse fazendo as denúncias ou defendendo as pessoas que estavam ali e precisavam, teriam o mesmo destino. Só que nós não podíamos deixar ficar assim. Não, ninguém mais ia morrer por essa condição, e nós não iríamos permitir que a memória e a luta deles caíssem no, no esquecimento. No Brasil, nós que defendemos o meio ambiente, que defendemos direitos humanos, somos diariamente criminalizados pelo agronegócio, pela mineração e pelo próprio Estado brasileiro. A cada ano, esse novo governo golpista ele tira um direito das populações tradicionais, ele limita a utilização das terras pelas próprias comunidades indígenas ou comunidades tradicionais. Momentos como esse aqui é muito importante para que a gente reflita de que forma os outros países estão contribuindo, em certa medida, para essas coisas acontecerem. Né? Qual a responsabilidade que cada um aqui tem com o que aconteceu sete anos atrás com o Zé Cláudio e com a Maria? Que responsabilidade tem cada um de nós aqui, com cada comunidade que está lá agora ou em qualquer outro lugar do mundo, defendendo sua cultura, defendendo o seu território, defendendo o seu meio de vida. É. Eu fico muito é, emocionada quando eu me lembro do Zé Cláudio, alguns meses antes de ser assassinado no TED Amazônia, falando que vivia com a bala na cabeça. Me lembro de cada vez que ele escrevia carta para os... Ele e a Maria escrevia carta para os ministros, fazia denúncia no Ministério Público do Estado brasileiro e nunca houve uma investigação sobre quais reais motivos eles tinham aquelas ameaças. Então, cabe também a nós, 
continuar a luta, continuar denunciando, continuar defendendo o meio ambiente e o nosso meio de vida, mas também propor. Propor e pressionar os governos a fazer um pouco mais. E isso não é uma esmola. Isso é nosso direito de continuar vivos, de continuar tendo as nossas florestas, de continuar tendo os nossos recursos e utilizar da forma como a gente sempre utilizou. Historicamente, utilizamos a floresta de forma sustentável. Nem não pode vir o governo vir e dizer que vocês só podem produzir nesse canto ou vocês só têm isso aqui para trabalhar e continuar sendo o maior violador de direitos humanos do país. Porque, para nós, sim, esse é o sentimento que nós temos. Porque mesmo depois de sete anos do assassinato do Zé Cláudio e da Maria, não tem ninguém preso. A impunidade é uma realidade muito cruel para nós que perdemos familiares, amigos. O estado onde eu vivo, a região sul e sudeste do Pará, é a região que mais mata defensores da terra, da água, das florestas. Diariamente saem notícias de tortura, de assassinato, de desapropriação das terras. E a gente, que a gente vê que o Estado não faz, não propõe. A justiça do Brasil tem um lado e não é o lado dos defensores. Infelizmente, eu tenho essa crítica muito forte do Estado, porque, na verdade, nós sentimos isso na pele. A criminalização contra os movimentos sociais, contra os defensores, nos últimos anos tem ficado muito cruel. Há 90 dias o Padre Amaro está preso. O Padre Amaro foi o sucessor da irmã Dorothy Stenck, a Napu. Há 90 dias ele está preso sobre acusações de crimes que nós sabemos que não o cometeu. Mas a própria justiça o mantém preso sobre esses argumentos. Enquanto as várias denúncias que o próprio Padre Mário fez com relação ao desmatamento, com relação à exploração de terras públicas, não houve nenhuma investigação. Se Cláudia Maria já fazia isso, Chico Mendes fez isso, Irmã Dorothy fez isso. E essas pessoas estão mortas ou presas. E cabe a nós fazer alguma coisa para mudar essa realidade, não só no Brasil, que eu também sei das histórias que acontecem com outros defensores em outros lugares do mundo. E o que cada um de nós que estamos aqui nessa sala estamos fazendo para ajudar a gente, para ajudar essas pessoas. Thank you very much. I, th I think it's a rare thing for a lot of people to hear firsthand the kind of stories that, that we, we heard there. Um, Fran, coming to you. Why did you found your organization, co-found uh, Not One More? And can you explain how you're helping to support environmental defenders? Um, so, I founded Not One More because of this moment, which was in Prey Long Forest in Cambodia. It was at, the, at an illegal logging site, so there were piles of huge piles of luxury timber behind us, which are worth hundreds of millions of US dollars, and which community defenders were burning in order to destroy the profit of the loggers, and so that there would not be corruption within their own community organization by taking and profiting from that wood, even though its value was so immense. And they are doing um, small-scale farming. You know, th this amount of money is unimaginable. And so at this moment, um, I was actually sort of just to the left of the picture. Um, Chit Ruti is the man who you see on the ground. Um, you can just see the back of his head and the soldier standing over him. Um, and just before this, um, I had been sitting next to him and we were waiting for that fire, um, those fires of that illegally cut logs uh, to burn down so that it would be safe to leave the area with the community defenders. And The reason that moment was so significant to me was because I, had, I was there as a filmmaker and I had previously spent three years uh, working in that forest with the communities as a researcher. And so I had this idea of being removed from the situation, being an observer, being independent. And in this moment, I realized that I was not independent and that none of us are independent. Uh, it, the moment was that I looked up and I saw there were guns pointed at me because I was next to Ruti when they came and they threw him to the ground. And so it was very significant in my life because it meant that 
my whole perspective shifted and I felt a sense of not, not really responsibility, but more simply that you don't get to be separate from what is happening to the planet and what is happening to the people who are right next to you. And um, I have a strong feeling that like with Not One More, our vision is that, you know, the whole planet, you know, we are neighbors to each other. We completely depend on the forests. We depend to, for them on the air that we breathe. We depend on the land um, in every part of the world because that produces the food that we eat three times a day. We are completely physically part of the natural world. And so defending it is not the problem of only activists, and they are not other, they are not <coughs> different kind of people from us. So that was the beginning. And this image that I wanted to show is um, the beginning of an analysis that we're working on using data that I'm sure you've all um, come across, collected by Global Witness, on where environmental defenders around the world are being murdered. Um, and so this is location data specific to those murders from 2015 to 2017. And I want to emphasize that this is not complete because we simply do not have information from many of the places where people are being killed. And also I want to emphasize that this just shows killings, and as Patrick said at the beginning, criminalization, intimidation, death threats, repression, the whole of um, these very ancient, very, very old systems of oppression that have run through capitalism and colonialism and feudalism. Um, you know, all of this is part of the same problem. It is, it is not simply a matter of these murders. But I wanted to show this to show that the intact forests of the world, so the, where you see green, uh, these are the areas which are you know, the great repositories of biodiversity, where we have um, forests absorbing carbon. Um, and around those forests and in those forests, defenders are being killed. Uh, and so this was an image, this is Chutvati's daughter, Soklina, who I got to know while making the documentary film about him. Um, and so what are the ways that we can address this issue? A very important one is to address impunity. Globally, um, it's estimated that there's around 99% impunity in killings of defenders. Um, so that's a 1% conviction rate, uh, which is shocking compared to, when you compare it to global average homicide conviction in general, um, which is around 60%. And so... Um, impunity is very important to address and uh, fundamentally st standing behind and standing with people who are at the front line, um, coming in and supporting them according to their needs rather than imposing an external solution. Thank you to the second. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, both of our first two speakers have referenced impunity as uh, it is one of the major issues. Uh, we'll come on to Felipe next. Um, welcome, Christopher. Um, uh, Felipe, we've heard Cloud Elisa's harrowing but also inspiring story. How do her experiences fit into the global context, do you think? Thanks, Patrick, um, for moderating this panel. Congratulations for the work of, uh, that you do in Global Witness. It did help us to understand that uh, what happened to Zé Claudio wasn't only a local problem in Brazil, but it was a global problem. You know, sometimes when we are in the South, we tend to look to ourselves and we forget what is the system that is working. And uh, the maps from Global Witness did help us to understand that it's not only a, a Brazilian uh, challenge to to move on from this brutal violence against defenders of the environment, but how we can act together with, um, internationally. It means that if it is an international uh, problem, they are, this is not local struggle. So Zé Claudio and Maria wasn't only fighting for their forest, but this is a local, uh, this is a global problem. I don't know if we have a map. Uh, we do. Yeah. <laughs> This is, this is the map of uh, blockade, maybe. This is the map of environmental justice movements, of uh, 
Egypt, the fights for, for the environment all over the world. These fights are played, these struggles are played against the ex extraction of natural resources. So it's against mining, deforestation, for land. What do they have in common that I see then speaking from, uh, from my experience as researching in South America? is the colonial system. It's capitalism and coloniality working together. Um, it's not the colonial times that we had in the past as a historical time, but coloniality. The other forms of inferiorization of people, dishumanization. When, uh, when Caudalisi speaks, and then uh, we, can, we, could, we could hear maybe such a, such a, a a talk also from Guatemala or from Colombia, uh, which means people who are fighting for, for their humanity to be recognized as human, you know, to, to be fighting against the process of inferiorization that they suffer. It means before being killed, they are racialized, they are inferiorized. They are turning to enemies who should be moved away uh, from, uh, f f from the path of growth, of, of the extraction of natural resources. So this means to decolonize our, our views, uh, Patrick, and to all of, here, uh, of you here, uh, and that's what I, I try to learn today in Brazil, being a white Brazilian from the South, male, uh, <clears throat> to understand how we can directly dialogue, understand their struggles, Understand the struggles of the Claudio Maria, of people who are fighting in Guatemala, in Filipinas. Understand when they say that forest is not a carbon, as yesterday they were being discussing here. Move from carbocentrism, <laughs> moving out from Eurocentrism, that respect and dialoguing with other uh, perspective of existence, other project, uh, life project, other ways to see and build a relationship with the environment. It means to fight against the separation of society and environment and see how we can uh, uh, live together and move on from uh, this intolerance, the impossibility to live with our difference that marks the world today, you know, is to maybe to destroy borders and frontiers and, and try to, to, to reimagine uh, coexistence. I'm talking a, a, a bit uh, in a philosophical way or, or, or using other concepts, but this is the everyday life in countries like Brazil uh, and Colombia, uh, in, the, in the global south that are marked by racism, by internal colonialism. Uh, I, I, I have, I have to, to disconstruct myself as a white Brazilian every day in class, <laughs> as all of you here, uh, as well, to deal with forest, uh, to deal with forest defenders, to deal with water defenders, to dialogue and to learn from them and to think how can we, that are not traditional people, I mean, not, not, not you, but me, you, and, uh, and many of us here, how can we fight together with them, respecting them? This is how we can uh, uh, remake mankind, humankind, into this planet that we all share together. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Christopher, welcome. It's, uh, it's very important that we hear from the business community, and, and we appreciate you stepping into the potential lion's den of a, of a panel which uh, has several NGOs and activists on it. Um, if companies operate according to the rule of law, ethically and sustainably, Arguably, there is no reason why they can't enjoy a harmonious relationship with the communities uh, in their countries of operation. So I'd like to know where um, OLAM sits uh, in this. What problems have you experienced on the ground? How did you deal with them? And what are the lessons that OLAM has learned from the experience? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize to, uh, to, to the room and, and to my fellow panelists. I was engaged in a passionate debate and lost track of time. Uh, uh, so and I particularly apologize to you for coming in, in the middle of your um, intervention. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, sorry for that. Uh, 
Olam is a, a global business that works uh, principally in developing countries. Uh, we are very much involved with um, uh, cash crops and commodities uh, such as cocoa, coffee, cotton, cashew, uh, but also palm oil, rubber and timber. Uh, very highly diversified and we are working in, uh, in many areas where uh, the social and environmental uh, issues facing local populations are uh, extremely difficult. Um, so, one of the things that has characterized Olam over, our, uh, over, the, over the years of its development is that it has stayed in countries where even where civil war uh, was um, devastating the country and has maintained a business with people living up country and providing uh, access to market and revenue to communities that were uh, agricultural communities uh, um, that were you know, basically needed uh, money to live and very few companies have done that. So um, my colleagues who are working in uh, places like uh, Cote d'Ivoire through the Troubles um, you know, can tell some very frightening stories of themselves being very close to, um, you know, at threat of their own lives from armed men. Um, but I think you probably don't want to hear about that. You're more interested um, in the interaction that we have in some supply chains that we operate where, for instance, we are operating large-scale palm, uh, palm or rubber plantations where we have a timber concession in North Congo, and that brings us into very much this uh, this very hot debate about uh, land allocation and the r the rights of local people for traditional for their traditional access um, uh, and land rights. Uh, so the principle that we adopted when we got into upstream plantation was really that the free and prior informed consent of the local populations was a sine qua non. Um, and I must confess, I have n I, we don't have any of the issues that you have been highlighting in South America because we don't have that, we don't operate land in South America in that way. But where we have plantations in, uh, in Gabon or a timber concession in North Congo, we have, uh, we have local people who, um, who use the forest, uh, who have traditional activities there, and at the same time experience very severe levels of poverty, deprivation, malnutrition, lack of access to services. And in those cases, the state has failed to provide for those communities and uh, the economic activity that a company like ours brings or can bring is a real lifeline to those communities, but it's got to be done in the right way. And uh, it's a very tough thing to do um, because uh, we are bringing a new form of development. We recognize the right of local peoples and communities to say no. Uh, we try and give them the tools through which to come to those decisions, but it is often a heated debate at the community level itself. Do we, uh, do we um, uh, accept the use of this land for a plantation or a forestry operation uh, or maintain you know, our existing mode of life? And you know you have to give the time for those uh, debates to um, to run through. I, I must say, you know, I I am I feel very fortunate that we have never been faced with the s uh, state of uh, you know, it, desperate illegality and violence that that my uh, fellow panelists have talked about. But I have seen. Uh, in you know in North Congo we have a state of complete absence of the, of of, uh, of the state in providing essential services and where our company is for instance operating the only viable hospital with with uh, with um, medicines um, and a school and uh, uh, um, various services to the local populations so I think. You know, I, I realize that um, the form of large-scale agricultural forestry that, that we operate in certain locations um, can have deep and negative impacts, but I believe that if you handle it in a sensitive way, if you provide a platform for local people, and if you involve civil society in decision-making and help, um, help to find a solution, then actually agriculture can be a force for good. Large-scale agriculture can be a force for good, and it can bring much more prosperity as well to those who choose not to participate in that, uh, in the sort of um, the company or the corporate side of agriculture, but who uh, can be enabled 
uh, to um, improve their own agricultural produce and participate in, in improved local economies. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Christopher. Um, I shall come back to you with a couple of penetrating questions in the second round. Um, Vicky, uh, last but not least, um, you personally are facing uh, significant risks in your own country, the Philippines, uh, as we've heard, being branded a terrorist by the president. Um, and obviously the Philippines is in a, in a very violent place right now. And you've heard from all the other panelists and you visited many of the countries uh, where these problems are most severe. Um, the killings um, and attacks on defenders are gaining more prominence in the media uh, and with some key governments, and not least here in Norway. Um, do you think the problem is just getting more attention or is it getting worse? How severe is it? Uh, thank you very much. Well. Uh, I think that the situation has really become very severe now, especially because human rights has become very low in the agenda of many countries. You know, we have states who are becoming more authoritarian and human rights is something that they don't like to even hear about and that's precisely the situation in my country. But not just in my country, in many countries it's the same story, you know, so that's one, one issue. The other is... Uh, is that, you know, the extraction that needs to happen in terms of extracting resources and all that. Many of these resources are found in indigenous people's territories because they were the ones who have really uh, 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 protected this and used it very sparingly so that it will not run out, you know, in, in a very fast time. And they have been protesting against a big economic interests who want to come inside to extract those resources. So that's the other factor, no? And, uh, and I think that the, the, uh, having heard what, what has been said by all the panelists, but also having visited a lot of uh, countries where this issue is coming up. I just came from Guatemala a month ago, and Guatemala, where 65% of the people there are indigenous, they are the ones suffering the most from this kind of impunity and, uh, and uh, criminalization. I went to visit uh, uh, people, leaders, really very good leaders who have been fighting against a dam project. One was Ara San Rafael Mine in... And, and, and the leaders are now imprisoned with charges, like 15 charges, and, and there's no way that they can ever get out of, of uh, prison because the moment they, they, they have a case dismissed, another case comes. So there's really a situation where the independence of judges is also very much under question, and, uh, and judges are colluding with companies because it's the companies that usually will file a case, and then the, ministry of pub, of, uh, the public ministry will file a case those, against those people. So, so I think uh, it's a very systemic problem. It's, it's, of course, based very much founded on racism and discrimination. And clearly, you can see that in Brazil, there's almost segregation there. And that's what, that's what I wrote in my report. But no, it's even worse in Guatemala. It's really almost apartheid, you know, where people, indigenous peoples are nobodies. And the majority who are in power are just a few, uh, few uh, mestizos. So, so that's that's the other factor, the racism and discrimination that's institutionalized and, and structural continues to persist. So what do we do? I think that uh, with my, with my uh, case where I was also included in a list of so-called terrorists, uh, to a certain extent, while it's of course very dangerous and very worrisome, uh, to a certain extent I see that as an opportunity to really blow up the issue at a global level and raise this whole issue and really challenge the multilateral organizations, the NGOs, OEOs, the governments, as well as corporations, to deal with this problem. I mean, there is no redress for most of those who have been in that kind of situation, and they just simply rot in jail. And that's going to be the same case if, in case we are we are uh, arrested, because our terrorist anti-terrorist act was is going to be amended. It says 40 years in jail, no bond, you know, no, you cannot bail, and so that that anti-terrorist laws are ev becoming even. Uh, stronger and, and really uh, seriously against human rights. So, so my, I would like to end by saying that uh, in my, I'm going to make a report before the Human Rights Council on criminalization, which al already was my plan even before some, this thing happened to me. Uh, and, and after I make that report, I would like to hold a big conference to really talk about this issue of uh, criminalization, bring the leaders who have been uh, subjected to this, as well as the support groups who have been giving them support, the lawyers, as well as states, to look into 
what are the protection mechanisms that the, ind the indigenous peoples can, uh, can uh, use, both individual and collective? Because many protection mechanisms is just for the individual, but for the case of indigenous peoples, it's really the collective. Their, their livelihoods are criminalized, you know, their movements are criminalized, their own organizations are criminalized. So it cannot just be addressed on an individual uh, basis. So that's one of the things that I, I, I look forward to, and hopefully I'll be able to get support and more information from you all about how we can collectively deal with this issue. We cannot simply allow such situation to, to, to continue to fester, because then in the end, you know, the people who really mean, you know, do, are doing the work are going to just disappear, and the people who are just continuing this kind of uh, extraction and, uh, and impunity will the ones who will be ruling the world. And we don't like that. So, so it's about time we all join hands and seriously put our heads together to think about the, the proper uh, solutions to this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've got two requests arising from that, one of which is, can we be invited to the conference? Um, and secondly, uh, will the government of Norway pay for it, please? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I've got a second round of questions. Uh, we have less time. Um, we all overran a little bit, including me. Um, so we have about 20 minutes to get through this next lot, leaving half an hour for a, a Q&A. Um, so, Claudia Lisa, at, at this conference and in this room, there are influential people from donor governments, not least Norway, who invest uh, over a billion uh, dollars a year in Brazil, uh, from industry and, and from international NGOs. What is your message to them, what's the most important thing any of these groups can do to help your community and defenders like you? And if you could do that in a couple of minutes, that would be great. Fazer com que esse recurso, com que esse dinheiro todo chegue até as bases, até as comunidades, que as comunidades tenham a possibilidade de usar esses recursos para sua produção, para sua própria defesa, para a continuação também das atividades, mas também da vida das pessoas. Né? Eu só escuto falar que tem muito dinheiro que os outros países mandam para o Brasil, mas efetivamente, é, na minha comunidade, posso falar da minha comunidade, a gente não tem recebido nenhum tipo de ajuda desse nível, é, não temos. José Cláudio e Maria, minha família e outras tantas famílias vivem naquele lugar há anos, há décadas. Nós nunca tivemos apoio de instituições de fora. Quando o bicho estava pegando, que é uma expressão que a gente usa para dizer que quando a coisa estava muito ameaçadora, tinha CPT ou a universidade para estar do nosso lado ajudando a escrever as denúncias, a, pedindo para a universidade que mapeasse onde estava madeireiro, onde estava carvoeiro, para onde ia madeira, para onde ia carne, para onde ia o carvão. Mas, assim, era a universidade e a CPT. Né? A gente nunca recebeu dinheiro ou recurso para a gente proteger nosso território e continuarmos vivos lutando por aquilo. Né? Tem sete anos que o Zé Cláudio e a Maria foram assassinados. E o saldo que nós temos disso é um pacote de injustiça, e não só com a nossa comunidade. Né? Depois do assassinato do Zé Cláudio e a Maria, nós nos unimos com outros líderes, com outras pessoas ameaçadas, né? para tentar fazer alguma estratégia de se defender e continuar vivo e continuar lutando pelos nossos direitos. Né? Mas o que eu pediria é que esse recurso chegue até as bases, chegue até as comunidades. Eu tenho absoluta certeza que ele vai ser muito bem usado. Thank you very much. And I, I've, I've heard this message from quite a few people in, in Claudio Lisa's position that a lot of money goes into places, it's not getting to where it needs to get to. And I think that donor governments need to put their heads together uh, to, to try and address that situation. Um, Fran, the, the situation, the political situation in Cambodia uh, is now very, very bad. Um, Human Rights Watch released a report today called The Dirty Dozen, uh, which is branding Hun Sen, the, the prime minister, as a fully fledged military dictator. What's the current situation for defenders in Cambodia? And what's your message to a company thinking of investing in land or natural resource business in that country? Mm. Well, the situation in Cambodia is really abysmal. It is 
a dictatorship now. Um, this happened over the last 10 months. So the ruling party dissolved the opposition party, which, um, to give you an idea of what that, what that looks like, the opposition party is called the Cambodian National Rescue Party. And um, a large number of political opponents and human rights defenders have been criminalized and are in jail, including the deputy leader of the opposition. There's a huge number of slap suits, um, so strategic litigation cases that um, brought by the government or by the ruling party, which are basically just designed to cripple any opposition. So they, um, the cases have no real foundation, that it's just a tool uh, to repress people. And so, um, and this has been apparent for, for a long time in Cambodia, actually. This, um, the situation is, it, it's as if now sort of the mask is falling from the regime. And um, a huge part of the issue with activists, with human rights defenders, not only protecting the environment, but all human rights defenders, has been the in non-independence of the judicial system. So the courts in that country are essentially a tool to repress civil society rather than to uphold the law. The law is quite decent in Cambodia, but um, that's not the way that the courts operate. <laughs> um, so the judiciary are, um, are often closely tied to the ruling party, and this was a problem in terms of the impunity in Chitvati's case was directly linked to that. Um, five young activists of the organization Mother Nature Cambodia, who I've worked with um, for the last four years, were criminalized uh, during a sand dredging campaign. And nevertheless, we actually won the campaign, which was, um, which was a great victory, which we did uh, essentially through a series of videos, um, short videos that went viral on Facebook. Facebook is a massive platform in Cambodia, um, politically and socially in all aspects of Cambodian public life. And the impact of those videos and the sustained media coverage was that um, Essentially, the issue was pushed up the national agenda. Uh, we exposed um, what looked like massive corruption because of the mismatch in reporting on Cambodian exports of sand and Singaporean reporting on imports of sand that they were buying from Cambodia. Um, and this embarrassed the, Cam the Singaporean government because they have such a reputation for transparency um, and they stopped buying Cambodian sand. But during that process, um, the sand dredging companies were, cr were bringing cases against and pushing the local authorities to arrest the young activists. Um, and so one of my colleagues, San Mala, spent over 10 and a half months in jail and he was um, in horrible conditions, could not lie flat, um, very difficult to sleep at night because there's so many people crammed into one cell, um, completely inedible food, and was very you know, reliant on the other members of the organization and friends um, writing to um, supporters to get funding and to, to be able to help them to just simply to survive, to have decent food to eat. Um, and the remarkable thing about all of those activists is that they've continued their actions since, so they haven't been uh, beaten into submission through this um, very serious uh, criminalization and intimidation. Thank you. Um, as someone who's worked in Cambodia, for, on Cambodia for 25 years, I find the whole thing completely tragic. Um, Felipe, um, what do you think progressive governments like Norway, and you can think about this in a global context or in the context of Brazil, can do more of? Um, is it about providing resources? Is it actually getting tough on other governments uh, through diplomatic means, through sanctions, whatever? What, what do you, or, 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 you know, be, feel free in your answer, what do you think the best thing that governments can do is to tackle this issue? Three minutes. <laughs> well, I'm just going to share some thoughts. And uh, it's great to, to, to be able to share the thoughts here in Norway. Because this is a country that had, in, in, in its history, been colonized and dominated by other countries. So I'm sure that the Norwegian people knows what is to fight for freedom, for autonomy, for self-government. Uh, so they, Nor Norway can play an important role, fundamental role, worldwide, being an European country that was colonized, know how it feels to be colonized. And so Norway should take a lot of care not to be colonizer. Uh, in the Amazon, in other countries. Um, for example, as, as, this, as, as Claude Elisio was saying, that there is, you need to find a way to support people 
who are on the ground, grassroots, because these are not local fights. These are global struggles. Uh, the, the global struggles against massive extraction of natural resources. There is no sustainable massive extraction of natural resources in the world. Our planet cannot, uh, f our planet does not support uh, this massive extraction of natural resources. In times that we are living now today in uh, the Anthropocene, it puts the risk to how to our humanity to live here. It's impossible to have sustainable soya plantations in, in the Amazon. Uh, we cannot. We, we should find other ways to, to, to live with the environment. So Nori can help us to, 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 to understand better other solutions, such as agroecology, for example. And also, it's not only helping abroad, but Nori, and I, I'm speaking about Nori, but as well as the same as France uh, or, or the UK, the whole global north, should look into themselves as well. The, and take the serious responsibility, such as, for example, what happened in Brazil at the beginning of the year, the crimes of Norsk Hydro. I'm talking about crimes because it wasn't an accident what happened in the Amazon. The dam burst, the contamination of rivers, and the killing of environmentalists that were fighting against the extraction of bauxite that is destroying the Amazon. I mean, it, it means we know that we are producing destruction abroad. We should look into ourselves. It's not a matter of just giving one billion to Brazil. If it's to give one billion to Brazil to extract five billion in bauxite, this money won't help to save the Amazon. And at the same time, to look seriously to the business that is played here in Norway, um, it's also to teach the other European countries how to act abroad. And I believe Norway, in the European Union, is the key country to change the colonialism that it's still, Europe is still uh, acting in the world. Being colonized, fighting for her freedom, as they did here, we can teach uh, the other countries, like how can we dialogue and respect other people, other countries that are, that, 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 that are away from us. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Christopher, um, obviously, uh, as Fran's map um, illustrated, um, the killings and violence against, uh, against offenders uh, certainly relates to what happens in forests, and we know um, in, in other places, including in some of OLAP's, OLAM's operations, there have been issues of environmental defenders and problems. Um, your business, as you, as you outlined it, includes two of the major drivers of deforestation, palm oil and logging. Um, and in the context of this conference, uh, reducing deforestation to mitigate the impacts of climate change, and in the context of what Felipe just said about sustainability, how can your business model work uh, to contribute to the, the objectives of this conference and, of course, the wider objectives of the planet? Because it seems to me to be a little bit counterintuitive. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as I said, uh, about 90% of our business is centered around smallholder supply chains, and that is a big focus of all of our activities in terms of the main sustainability activities that we have, uh, which are around supporting smallholder communities, helping them to get together into cooperatives, giving them training, providing them with financing to get better crops and better yields. And that is a very large part of what we do. There is a part of what we do which is about large-scale plantation activities, as I, as I said, and our, uh, our intention from the start, and we have re reinforced that through our policies and through our actions on the ground, is to make sure that local people play a part and benefit from those activities. So. Um, when I first went to Gabon, which is where we have our palm operations, in the rural areas of Gabon where we were, uh, we were going to, through villages where um, there were no schools, uh, the children were suffering from malnutrition with swollen bellies, uh, there were no opportunities. The first thing that people do as soon as they have any money is to go to the city and try and find an uncle or somebody in power who is going to support them. And in order for those communities to have some kind of opportunity, then an agricultural production of some sort is the basic thing that everybody can do. And you know, those, those are communities that have lived on hunting uh, for, for generations. 
Uh, every time I go down that road I, and I see a crocodile or a pangolin or a python or a, a, a hornbill, I stop and I ask the hunter, so, you know, how much is this piece of meat, for, for starters, and how far did you go? And they go, well, I had to go three days, or I had to go five days to get this crocodile. And when, not my, when I was young, my grandfather used to kill the crocodile behind the house, but now it's far away. But when you ask them, is that a problem, they say, ah, no, you know, nature's bounty is infinite. So there's a real, uh, there's a real sense in which, you know, those communities are faced with changes in the environment which go because the although they are themselves hunting and depending on those natural resources, they're no longer doing it with nets and spears, they're doing it with wire and with, with guns, and the meat is being exported to the ma main cities, and so those resources are running out, and they don't participate in the logging industries, for instance. So our um, palm plantations were done with the consent of the local people, we did the mapping of their community areas, we uh, came to an accord with those communities about where we should go, if they had sacred sites, and we gave preferential treatment to those local communities for them to participate. And that gives them a stake in being our neighbors long term and participating in the development of their country. So I think that, I mean, it's very easy, and you know, I know that in this context I'm kind of uh, alone on this stage, but it's very easy to, to brush all of, uh, all of agri-industry and all of large-scale um, development with the same brush. But I think that you have to also look at the bigger picture of the development pathway of these countries. What happens in Gabon when the oil runs out and the money from the central government f finishes? The, the, the forest of that, of that country will be the only natural resource unless they develop something which is from their own capacity. And, and so we operate large-scale plant plantations. The next step is to ensure that people get the better seed varieties, uh, diversification, so that they can actually uh, they can uh, provide for their families and provide for their communities themselves. And that requires a much greater investment in uh, social capability within companies like ours to understand what the needs of the communities are and respond to their grievances and adapt to that context. Okay, thank you. Uh, one thing I'll say on, on that, and it's, it's not Olam's fault at all, but there's a court case in Paris um, and involves work that Global Witness has been doing over the years where the, the heads of state of Gabon and the Republic of Congo and, um, and a couple of other countries, Equatorial Guinea, uh, have, have, are uh, going through an asset seizure court case uh, because of the large mansions that they own in Paris and the exotic car collections. So when, you know, you say the government can't build a hospital in the Republic of Congo. Well, actually, they could. Um, they just don't. Um, that's not your fault, but it's... it's, it's glad. In, terms of, in terms of tackling <laughs> this issue, it, it, with that one it, well. it's a consideration. Corruption's a central part. Vicky, I, I hope this isn't a, a cheeky question. I just think you, you've heard now the second round of questions. You have sort of been involved in this area probably longer than any of us. Um, you've been to more countries than any of us. Is, is there any kind of final conclusion you would like to, to bring out of what you've heard and, and what you're planning next with criminalization and that kind of thing? Well, uh, first of all, I think that uh, what I have seen in many countries is really if the communities themselves are empowered, they are strengthened to have better control over the resources. That is what's going to change the equation. And I've seen this, like for instance, I was in Mexico, and you will see this, some of these autonomous municipalities, they are the ones uh, securing their community, so well-being and peace and security is much better ensured. And they are the ones thinking of what they need to do to be able to make their lives more economically uh, sound, you know. And, and, and there are many communities like that that I have seen in different uh, uh, parts of the world where the indigenous people, number one, either because the state is not there and therefore they themselves have to do what they can to govern themselves. And, uh, and uh, they are the ones doing work around the issues of even education. They have taken up the, the, the challenge of uh, really developing education institutions for their own children to learn their values and their cultures and traditional knowledge. So that's one. I think that we really need to invest a lot in helping the local, the communities 
strengthen themselves. And there are many communities who are in that state. But that has to be coupled with, of course, the campaigns that we are doing globally and, and, and nationally and regionally against this impunity and corruption. There has to be also people who will be looking at that. But if I, I think that if really resources are given, to communities like those, and they will show, they will prove. In fact, I, I asked the people, I said, do you have data which shows that because you are the ones governing yourself, they have community police, the drug cartels are not coming in, so they are able to be more secure? And they said, no, because we don't have people who can write. So people who are w willing to document those kinds of experiences is, is what we need to show that uh, while the world is such an, a mess, there are communities which are vibrant, which are doing what they can. And this is where we should gather more hope. And second, and, and of course, the global campaign. So next year, I'm going to do a report on indigenous governance systems. No, Actually, I'm introducing it already before the General Assembly, where I will look into how the indigenous peoples are governing themselves, what good practices are there that can be get highlighted, and how does government support those kinds of indigenous governance that really works, you know. And, and for, so in the end, I just say that uh, it, this world seems to be such a hopeless, we, we find ourselves in such a hopeless situation. But uh, if you go back down to the, gr to the ground and see these experiences, then it gives you a lot of hope. And I think that's where we should be investing a lot of our efforts as well as our resources. I think, yeah. well, that's... Uh a great way to end this part of the panel uh, on a, a message of hope. I, I too feel inspired by what can be done, um, which uh, you know I, I think is a challenge for us all. Okay, so now we're going to questions. As I say, if people have submitted them on an app, they should come up here. If people want to come to the microphone, I would request, as everyone always does, that you, you know, I don't mind whether it's a question or an insight, but please do not make it an informal presentation. Uh, we don't have much time. Um, slight, we're about a minute over time, a couple of minutes over time so far. Um, yeah, so um, just you know, a few things to throw in that came out of that. Uh, people are being racialized, dehumanized, human rights low in the agenda, criminalization, impunity, um, money not getting where it needs to, the need to engage local people. Um, and to strengthen communities. Just some things to think about. So, uh, I saw one question, I think, down in the second row, did I? Adele? You need to come to the microphone here. Bom dia a todos e a todas. Meu nome é Edel, eu venho da Amazônia. É, faço parte da continuidade da luta é de Chico Mendes, que talvez muitos de vocês se recordem aqui, que foi assassinado na década de 80 no Brasil. É uma pergunta para o Felipe e para a Claudelice e também para a nossa grande defensora, é como que ela visualiza o que ela falou do racismo e da invisibilidade também desse racismo. Eu sou o que os europeus me chamaram nessa constituição de nova raça no Brasil da cabocla. Né? Eu sou afrodescendente, afroindígena, eu sou descendente de branco, eu sou das três gerações que eles apelidaram de cabocla. Né? Eu ressignifiquei, eu sou a cabocla, eu sou a mulher negra da floresta afroindígena. E aí eu queria que o Felipe falasse dessa invisibilidade, desse segmento, dessa população que é fortemente ameaçada no Brasil, né? a Claudelice também, que eu creio que é uma cabocla também, né? invisibilizado, que sofre o racismo, mas eu queria que ele explicasse do racismo, o racismo socioambiental, que é onde nós estamos nos nossos territórios, nesses territórios ameaçados, eu venho de lá de onde a Hidro Alu Norte estourou. E aí, Felipe, não é só acidente, não, porque tinha relatórios antes. E também queria lhe dizer que cometeram essa semana novo, novo crime que foi abrir clandestinamente a... a a distribuição do resíduo dentro da floresta, que é o nosso rio. E eu queria explicar que o nosso rio é nossa vida, a floresta é nossa vida. Queria que vocês comentassem um pouco isso, dessa invisibilidade, desse racismo, dessa, é, dessa, desses novos grupos que também foram criados com o processo de colonização no mundo. Thanks a lot, uh, Edel, for your comments and, and, and this hard question. It's hard to speak of racism in Brazil, being white. So being an anti-racist among the racists. Uh, but without, uh, this, without understanding 
how racism works in Brazil, what is racism in Brazil, we, we can't understand inequality and we can't fight against inequality uh, because racism is structured in Brazilian society. Uh, racism naturalizes inferiorization. Uh, racism uh, dehumanizes people. Uh, Brazil, Brazil in the past had created this myth of racial democracy. And in Brazil, we have friendly racism. Uh, it's it's very, very often we listen that there is no racism against indigenous people in Brazil. But indigenous people are fighting to, to show that there is racism, that they are killed because it, they suffer racism, because their land is not demarcated because of institutional racism. And uh, what is uh, environmental racism? If, uh, if uh, it's a concept that comes from the fights of black movement in the US, that the zones of sacrifices, these areas that can be used to, to the extraction of natural resources or dumping waste, very often it's racialized populations who are living there, inferiorized population, either indigenous, either black communities, caboclo, Afro-indigenous, it means non-white, no supremacy, no, 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 not the elites of, of, of those countries. So talking about racism, it's, it's necessary for us to understand violence, uh, the destruction of the territory in Brazil, and to fight against that. Racism is like, uh, it's, it's, it's a sickness in society. We need to fight racism to live together. And of course, uh, we're not without it um, in Europe or America, um, and that's an increasing problem. Um, can I just get an idea of how many questions there will be? Anyone? One there, one at the back there. Sorry, okay, so there's... Okay. Quite a few, okay. So um, maybe if we go over here, so Jonathan, I think, in the front row, then the hand I can see way up behind, um, and the woman in the second row, and then uh, I'll come to the, the second row. I'll just take three to start with. Yeah, everyone needs to come to the mic for the, uh, for the translation. Okay, uh, Jonathan Watts of The Guardian, thank you all. Uh, we uh, work with Global Witness, obviously, to uh, highlight some of these issues that you, you've looked into in great detail. Um, I, I sometimes fear that our readers, they sympathize, they understand, they often read, but then they feel powerless. Um, they feel guilty because they're partly complicit in their consumption. Um, but then what do they do? Um, so what would be your suggestions to anybody who feels something is wrong and wants to do something about it? And uh, obviously, if you could go beyond just cons c the obvious ones of like consuming sensibly, uh, it would be really great. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll take the other two questions. Um, I'm not quite sure how to run that one. It could be like one quick answer each or a couple of you doing um, slightly more. We'll, we'll cut with a little evolve. Um, okay, so the guy who is um, there. Okay. <laughs> Tricky. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Akimar and I come from Kenya and thank you for the very powerful presentation from the panelist. My question is, uh, relates to threats to human rights defenders happen at the spa of the moment. They are very impromptu, they are often reactionary, and threats cannot sometimes be predicted, and intervention and support may not be programmable. How do we develop flexible support mechanisms that are targeted to this very fluid space that is difficult to program response, and often, these human rights defenders, their lives are snapped at the highest moments of their lives and their families are left destitute. Thank you. That's a hard question. Um, yes, 
please. Uh, hi, Ines Luna from the Rainforest Foundation, Norway. Uh, I would like to ask a question to Miss Victoria Talakorpus and to Christopher Stewart. What do you think um, is the role of private sector in in protecting human rights defenders and environmental environmentalists? Because uh, uh, being uh, in opposition sometimes where the government and the state is not present, uh, how can they be proactive to push those authorities to comply, to be a part of the solution, and also uh, in uh, internationally, uh, how, which role should they play internationally as well as on, in these countries? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so to the, the first question from Jonathan. To the other sure, movie. please do. Sorry. Please do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, just very quickly, uh, Jonathan's question. I think that uh, that it's really a key that uh, that people are are more vigilant in terms of when they read something. There is some. Uh, action that they can take in terms of even just making statements or uh, reaching out to their own uh, legislators to speak up. Because I, in, my, in my particular experience, when the world, when, when this thing happened to me and lots of people were sending statements everywhere, it somehow, you know, uh, uh, tempered a bit the government response. In fact, they are not talking up, they are hardly talking about it. So I think that immediate response of, of making people have statements and then organizing a mechanism to get the statements reach the, the ones who are uh, the, the perpetrators, that's one aspect. And as to uh, Kimaran's uh, question, uh, you know, there are existing mechanisms. For instance, the mandate of the special rapporteurs is really the quick response kind of thing because the moment that's sent to us, we immediately write to the government and ask them, what exactly are you doing about this issue? You know, so that's one. But there are other mechanisms. What I think we need is to also undertake a massive education and awareness raising about what are the mechanisms that are around that can be used and how can you use it more effectively and who are the people who, are, who can be reached out to do these kinds of actions, no? Because that's really, it's the quick reaction uh, thing that matters when these kinds kinds of uh, events happen. No? So I just wanted to uh, to share that. And then the question on the private sector. I think we have to dialogue with the private sector. More meetings of this kind has to be done because in the end it's to the self-enlightened interest of the private sector that there is better peace, more security, and really people are coming together to talk about what development do we really like to happen and how do we ensure that the environment is not destroyed in our effort to do economic growth, etc. And of course, to question those models, you know, and maybe there are there are investors, there are private sector who are also willing to to do something, even without a very high re return of investment. And those are the kinds of people that we need to look for. So I just have to apologize and just go thank, to the other thank side. Thank you. Vicky. I will come back. Um, <laughs> if you don't make it back, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so, um, well, maybe just carrying on Vicky's thread, if we go straight to Christopher on the, the private sector question, and I'll come back to the first one if anyone's got anything to add. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as a producer of commodities, one of the real, uh, and the, you know, uh, leading on the, on the sustainability of those commodities for Olam, the, the, the big challenge is that investing in sustainability, investing in environmental protection, investing in community resourcing, is an expensive business and requires investment, and we are all competing in a very cutthroat uh, uh, environment uh, where typically the, uh, the, the return margins on commodities uh, is, is um, in the low percent. Uh, and therefore, what we are looking for is for our own customers, who are the big, uh, the big um, uh, brand companies, as well as the end consumers, to, be, to have a, an understanding of the investments that are required at the production end and to participate in that cost so that more of the value of the produce that is produced by farmers and, and uh, producers of, of raw materials returns to them. Can you, can you sort of 
publicise that in your marketing and saying we want you, we're, we're going to put the prices up because we're helping protect human rights. It seems so, like so uh, are, we sell, we don't sell to the consumers. You will not find sure. Olam branded stuff on your shelves. So the way that we communicate that this is a good produce currently is through certification systems. And there are a lot of problems with certification systems, but they have been a very powerful way of bringing together businesses and NGOs and governments on to, to the same table to understand what the challenge is. I think that that's, this is a transitional step. I think that there is a huge amount of value in now for companies, especially the big global well-resourced companies like ourselves, to be thinking what is the next step for uh, net positive agriculture. And that's something that I'm very passionate about. I believe that you know, the, uh, the models that have been uh, developed over the last 50 years, which have resulted in a steady degradation of natural resources and, and human, rights, human rights violations like the ones that we've heard about, this is not tenable for the long-term future. We have to find exa shining examples of where we can build natural capital, i.e. restore forests, uh, restore the function, functioning of ecosystems, restore the dignity of local communities and their participation in those supply chains so that they participate and they can, uh, they can also uh, get some return on the value of those products. But that involves a, a much, much greater degree of transparency, of traceability of the supplies uh, back to the farmers and the farming communities and a participation of the consuming markets in uh, in, in paying, because I can tell you that the current, the current system is that people spend roughly three seconds on their choice of chocolate bar, and uh, very, very few of them will look at the label to see whether it's got the frog or the fair trade. It's a very small proportion, and when you're looking at other commodities like palm oil, it's even tinier. So there must be a development of consciousness amongst the consumers that they must participate in paying uh, two cents on the dollar more for those produce so that they can feel good that they are contributing to a decent standard of living and the protection of the ecosystems in the places from which they source their produce. And that, I think, is where we, as a global business, have to be setting a very high standard and demanding of our own industry that they participate in this sort of, uh, in this sort of benchmarking event. Okay, and, and perhaps also companies should have on the label when they are sort of uh, risking human rights abuses, but we can debate that one and on. Um, uh, the, the question from the, the, the gentleman from Kenya, how to deal with um, the impromptu threat uh, to defenders, who would like to take that question? Um, so I've been in a number of demonstrations in Cambodia, one of which turned violent and a few have been just a bit dodgy. and. Um, those, th those situations, like the one where I showed the slide where Vuti was attacked, that was exactly as you describe. You know, it was, um, it was in, um, it arose quite suddenly. But we had known beforehand that there was going to be this gathering of the forest peoples who live around this forest and who protect it, and that, it, and it was going to be a large one. So, and that was planned. And in the, f in the first days um, of the demonstration, the UN was there. And also, we were there as a, a small you know, film crew, and Al Jazeera was there reporting, and the, local, the, the national um, human rights organizations, Likido and the Cambodian Center for Human Rights, were monitoring. Um, and by the time this happened, um, they had left. <laughs> so it was, the, um, it was simply the community defenders, and, and the reason that in, on that day that Chip Viti wasn't killed was because all the community members rushed in and pulled him out of that situation. They put their own bodies in between him and the guns. And it was the power of numbers and the safety in numbers. Um, and so I would say two things. One is that um, when you do have um, good national human rights organizations and international um, human rights organizations who are monitoring and who are attending you know, every event where, they, where you know that there might be um, conflict, um, especially if there's an eviction that's planned for a certain date, um, that monitoring can be very, very important. Um, whether or not it's an official you know, whether or not it's a UN official. Like when we were there um, and we were filming, 
the soldiers went along the line of sort of, there were sort of four cameras pointed um, at the scene of what was happening. The soldiers were saying like, uh, turn off your cameras. And they came along with the butts of the guns and were trying to smash our, our, our cameras and we were sort of pulling them out of the way. But um, simply witnessing can be very important. And, and yes, it's impromptu in a sense, but it's also, um, I think quite often you know in advance when there's gonna be tension and conflict. Um, and, and the other lesson from that, I think, is that um, like a lot of indigenous communities are, you know, if you're going to patrol the forest or if you're, um, if you're in any way having a meeting or any kind of demonstration, you're doing it together as a, you know, strong community action in a way that, um, you know, some, some activists or, you know, in a more sort of global north sense, there's, there's often more emphasis on individual action, but that collective action is actually a very, very strong component of our security um, Thank as you. people defending the forest. Or Thanks. The I, mean, I think this is obviously a subject that will take a lot of, lot of debate, but I think a key thing coming out of that is if you're in a situation where you think there might be trouble, make sure people know about it, make sure that there are people there who could monitor it, safety in numbers. I've got my own experience from Liberia when two guys... Uh, were picked up by the police um, uh, for, for, for similar things. Uh, and myself and a couple of colleagues just went to the police station in this rural town and sat there. Um, and it was quite interesting to see what local police in the middle of nowhere do when you've got a few foreigners sitting there going, hey, we're not going. Um, anyway, so next round of questions. There was one, I think, in the back earlier on I saw a hand. Is that right? Is that still a question? Okay, there's one there. Um, you Okay, and who else have we got? Okay, person at the back there, and uh, a woman here. Is that it at the moment? A man there. Okay, so one, two, three. Okay. Um, great, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, the presentations. My name is Victor. I'm from Guatemala. Um, I have a, a, a question is, is stressing on, on what uh, Vicky Tauli mentioned uh, about the, the simultaneous uh, effort that uh, many communities and indigenous peoples are doing uh, while defending their territories, but also trying to recover to strengthen their own uh, self-governance uh, uh, systems in their territories. So my question is to you, to the defenders uh, and the defender organizations, uh, what do you see in the future in terms of, of more uh, local networking to, to build uh, protection for, for, for leaders, for threatened people uh, within the local, uh, and trying to use the, 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 the organizations, the networking at the local level? And what, uh, what uh, do you see in terms of, of involving uh, young people, involving uh, the education system, the, all, all, all the networking that locally is, is, is being in place for other purposes, but trying to, to, to build more effective local networks to, to defend uh, uh, threatened people? Thank you. OK, we'll take uh, two others. Uh, so the person who's at the back over there, who I can't see because of the lights, so you're there. Everyone creeps up on me. Comes are getting old. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my question to you is, or maybe some points to think about. Many times we ask uh, companies, corporations, you know, we ask, we, we seek to hold them accountable against violations. My question is, what are very specific uh, ways in which countries in their bilateral agreements for support, uh, Red Plus, or whatever payments we are doing? Have we, how have we examined how we can hold other countries that we have agreements with, bilateral agreements with, and holding them accountable in terms of responding to human rights and environmental uh, defenders and, and those violations? We need to find ways to do that. It can't just be holding other corporations alone. It's really how do you form partnerships with a country that is not responding or, or respecting and protecting those rights? Good question. Um, the guy with the beard, I think, was you. Oh, sorry. Okay, you first. Uh, good morning. I'm Nonette uh, from the tenure facility. Uh, we work closely with indigenous peoples in the front lines, and I think that my question is that there is a, 
there is a risk that uh, indigenous peoples that are defending their territories already take and they're prepared for it. And what, what I feel uh, we probably, I would like to hear two things. One is, uh, to what extent are we investing on um, uh, buddies, you know, lawyers and legal, legal groups that actually accompany the people that are in danger? Uh, the fact that they are lawyers and they have a network actually is a deterrent on its own. But we need to invest in those, and less and less money is going into those, those types of organizations, that's one. And the second is uh, we have to offer solutions to those businesses that really see the defenders as enemies. And we need to take them there and kind of be ahead of the game there instead of uh, always being prepared. The partners are actually understand that this is a risk, this is a life risk, and they're happy to, uh, not happy, but they know it, but they have to do it, it's a calling. But I think the solution is an important one. And that, uh, 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 yeah, I guess seeing it from that side, sometimes people don't agree easily. But uh, I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to hear what you, you would like, to, what, what you would respond to. How would you, how do, how you think it's possible to do it? Okay, so one last question from you. We have, uh, by the time you've asked yours, we, we have four minutes and fifteen seconds before we have to finish. We have to be out of this room really quickly because another meeting's happening. So the pressure's on you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Jeff Campbell with the Forest and Farm Facility, also trying to support uh, organizations at the local level. And I guess this is follows up on the, the two previous comments, which is, why is it so difficult to get resources to build organizations and to strengthen organizations um, uh, of, uh, of people, whether it's for defending their rights, for advocacy, for uh, becoming bigger actors in the private sector? There seems to be a complete lack of understanding that building that capacity is the sort of uh, the ground level entry point for all red and all of these other activities. We keep hearing the importance of organizing and supporting the struggles of people themselves. Where, where, where are we failing in communicating that this is a sort of the, the fundamental building block which is needed? Thank you. Okay, we have four minutes uh, to get through these. So who would like to take the question that uh, Victor asked on uh, networking? Yeah? Bom, eu preciso fazer algumas considerações sobre algumas perguntas que vieram. Eu sei do tempo, é, eu queria falar sobre todas, mas eu sei que eu não vou conseguir. A respeito dos recursos e das sugestões possíveis para que é, essas reuniões que são feitas sobre o RED sejam efetivas. Primeiro é reavaliar como, de que forma esse recurso está chegando, por exemplo, no Brasil ou em outros países, e se está tendo uma efetividade da aplicação desses recursos. No começo da minha fala, eu falei que o Estado brasileiro, posso falar do meu país, é o Estado que mais viola direitos humanos dentro do meu país. De que forma o próprio governo está usando esse recurso que vai daqui para lá? Para criminalizar mais ainda a gente, para prender a nós? Né? Como eu já falei, a situação do Padre Mário e outros tantos né, que estão sendo criminalizados. De que forma esse dinheiro está sendo aplicado? por exemplo, com relação ao racismo institucionalizado contra nós ambientalistas. Né? É uma das reflexões que deve se fazer durante essas reuniões sobre esse recurso que vai para o meu país. É, sobre a proteção, os jovens são essenciais para que a gente consolide essas redes de autoproteção, porque como já foi dito aqui, a gente não confia no Estado, nós não confiamos na polícia. A mesma polícia que pega a propina, que pega o dinheiro, é o mesmo que prende a gente. E eu, são, vão ser os mesmos que vão julgar a nós. Então, a justiça ela tem um lado no Brasil. E a gente nem sempre pode contar com ela. Claro que existem as exceções, mas elas são bem poucas. É... A outra coisa é pressionar o Estado brasileiro. Né? A colega perguntou o que, é que nós devemos fazer com esses países que não fazem os acordos ou que fazem os acordos e não cumprem. Pressioná-los a fazer. Né? Se existe um acordo, por que, que não é cumprido? Mas de que forma está sendo analisado se está sendo cumprido ou não esses acordos? Essas são algumas das sugestões. Eu queria falar sobre todas, mas o nosso tempo não permite. Depois do painel, quem quiser procurar aí... A gente está disponível. And I think, thank you. And I, I think, in the interests of time, 
uh, Claude Lisa has, has partially answered the question about what specific uh, things that bilaterals can do. Uh, if anyone else wants to add to that question, obviously Norway is a big bilateral supporter of Brazil. Uh, we've heard from the people on the ground. Um, you know, it would be great to have someone from Norway on the panel, actually, but we don't have uh, from the Norwegian government, that is. Um, okay, so uh, another question was uh, from, uh, from Victor, which was about networking at the local level. How do we improve networking at the local level? We're going to need some rapid answers from somebody who would like to do that. Just one uh, first comment. Uh, to understand violence in, uh, in countries such as Brazil, for example, or Honduras, you need to understand the local context uh, very deeply, know how it works, because why some people are killed and others not. So just to highlight that we don't have any universal answer. Uh, there is no model that can be applied everywhere, but it should be local. Uh, we need to, to dialogue locally. The case of Pará, for instance, you know, in Brazil is very specific, the situation in Pará, why it's so violent there more than other places. We need to look carefully in the local context to understand how we can act and help. <clears throat> okay, uh, so uh, the question from uh, Nonette um, relating to investments in legal support. Did we have someone who could speak to that? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, I think it's very important, and it was a, it's a good question. And I think it relates to what we've heard again and again from different panelists, and also from people raising questions. That, um, in a sense, the entire funding model um, to support both human rights and the environment, which of course are not separate issues, is entirely focused on big organisations, big investments, um, which never reaches the people on the ground and and it's not tailored to exactly what people need, like the people who are most in danger and who are at the front line. Um, and that's what, what needs to happen. And legal support um, is very important. And um, I think the question was, was why aren't there more resources available for sort of legal accompaniment? I don't know why. It should be. <laughs> um, it's, it's extremely important. And I've seen it um, across rural Cambodia, like people who are facing really serious threats don't have the legal support that they need. And it's not expensive. You don't need um, an international lawyer. You need a local lawyer who has an understanding, who has some experience, and who is willing to dialogue and work closely with the communities. Thank you. And I think this also partly goes to answer your question, especially in the interest of time, in terms of why is it so hard to get resources to the people that need them. I don't think we have a chance to sort of really flesh that out enough, but we know that it needs to be done. Um, and so Victor's question, I think, still partly remains uh, unanswered. I could provide an answer to it in terms of you know, this need for networking at a local level. I, I think that, you know, from talking to various colleagues, not least friends of mine on this panel, you know, outside of this panel, that one thing we have to do as civil society, and we need the support of the people with the resources to do it, is to build sort of a really, really strong coalition which brings local organisations uh, in a particular country together, the national organisations in that country, the international organisations that can work together in a coordinated way to work on resources, security, advocacy, and all of those things. Um, we are, we are over time. Um, before I finally wrap up, just to remind you, we, everyone needs to be out of this room within in 10 minutes. There's another meeting coming in, and apparently we'll be herded off to a particular, the, the Brasserie restaurant. Um, I just want to thank uh, you all for coming to this panel, for the, for the great questions. And most of all, I want to thank, uh, well, actually, I want to thank the Norwegian government for hosting it, but I want to thank this fantastic panel. I, I think it's been a privilege to listen to what they have to say. 